Uh, if you've got a Bible there with you, just hang on to it. I'm going to tell you to turn somewhere in a second. Before I do, uh, we uh, have had a great couple of weeks. Really, really enjoyed the speakers. Who's enjoyed the last couple of weeks? Have been, yep, Daniel, again, Daniel has. Daniel's, been, Daniel's really enjoyed it. Daniel, have you enjoyed the last couple of weeks? Reverse psychology? No, I was thinking everyone else would then speak up. Um, had a great couple of weeks, um, and um, thank you so much uh, to everybody that um, supported last week. Daniel did come up to me at the end of the service, and he did get angry at me, and he did say, Alan, you should have told me to bring more than 10 kids, so praise God, all the kids that they brought were sponsored last week. And uh, yep, Daniel's excited about that as well. It's awesome. It's great. It's good to have the energy in the room. Um, so, but we've had a good couple of weeks. Um, but the last couple of weeks, here's what happens when a speaker comes. They kind of ask you, you know, what, where, where are you on as far as a journey goes with, uh, with your gathering? What are you speaking about? And so on. And so you, go, you say to them, well, this is where I'm going to go. But you ever have those moments in life where you say something to somebody else, but you don't expect them to tell everybody else? You know? Have that? Well, the last couple of weeks, I've, I've told our, our speakers that we're going to go and I want to talk about discipleship, um, not thinking that they would stand up and go, well, guess what? You're going to talk about discipleship. I was hoping to keep it a bit secretive because when we talk about discipleship, um, there can be a couple of responses. Number one, people can, can switch off and think, well, I'm a disciple. I don't need that. The other response can be, oh, here we go. It's going to be another Christian beat down. Anyone ever feel like that sometimes? People get up, they talk about uh, discipleship and it feels like a Christian beatdown. Discipleship talks are about beating you into the ground and telling you that you're just not good enough. You've got to try harder. You've got to give more. You've got to this, you've got to that. Um, so I was hoping that you didn't know where I was going this week so you wouldn't think those things. So if anyone's thinking those things, I want you to stop thinking those things. I am going to talk for the next few weeks about this area of discipleship. I mentioned to you a few weeks ago that I wanted to do a series of messages and I wanted to call it this, I wish he never said that. Remember that? I want to do a series of messages on I wish he never said that. Now I was planning on doing that down the track at some point, but you know what I've realised? Just about everything that Jesus said that I wish he didn't say was about discipleship. Just about everything that he said that I wish he never said was spoken to his disciples about what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus. So I'm going to combine the two and I'm going to spend the next few weeks talking about discipleship slash I wish he never said that. How many of you have things, have read things in the Bible and you just wish they weren't there? Okay, there's a passage about not telling fibs. You wish that wasn't there because the rest of you are fibbing to me. There's plenty of stuff in that book that we read and we go, I really wish that it wasn't there. I wish he never said that. But it's recorded and he did. So for the next few weeks, I'm going to talk about discipleship slash uh, I wish he never said that. But it's not probably what we think. And I think this is one of the problems when we talk about discipleship. So I want to let you know up front, I'm not about to give you a Christian beatdown, okay? I'm not here to, to pull out the Word of God and to use it to make us feel guilty. I don't want to use it to make us feel condemned. I don't want to use it to make us feel second rate. I don't want to use it to make us compare ourselves with, say, believers in another culture who were born with a different worldview and a different background, whether it be better, uh, less indifferent, whatever, but I do want you to listen to the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. I want you to open up your heart and I want you to allow God by his spirit to take you on an individualized, personalized journey. Because you are an individualized, personalized disciple of Jesus Christ. And quite often when we hear teaching about discipleship, it's fairly broad brushed. It's fairly broad brushed. But I know that the way God has dealt with me in my journey has been very different to the way God has dealt with you in your journey. Anyone amen that? God deals with us where we're at and he speaks to us in a language we understand. He guides us in a, a path that he illuminates for us. And it might not be the same path for everybody. I was uh, speaking at a youth with a mission school this week, uh, the guys that were here and I was speaking to them for four days about the topic of re-entry. 
And it, I was talking about what it means to, to go from this incredible experience they've had in Youth with a Mission. Six months surrounded by people that every time you have a problem, they want to pray for you. Every time you don't understand something, they go to the Bible. What does the Word of God say about it? And now, as of Friday, they were jumping on planes and flying back to jobs where nobody gives them anything about Jesus. All they care about is profit. Going back to universities where nobody cares about the validity of these ancient documents. All they care about is humanism and individualism. Some cases they're going back to, to churches where the, the people are wonderful, but maybe they've had their eyes opened up to things that they didn't believe before they came. There, there's one man there saying, I'm going back to a gathering and they don't talk about the Holy Spirit or believe in the gifts of the, or anything like that. How do I transition back there and not do damage to myself, not do damage to that group of people, not go back proud and arrogant? So I spent some time and we were talking about these issues and this issue came up about discipleship in the conversation. And it just dawned on me at one moment in the conversation that, that in the book of Acts, when, uh, when the disciples uh, uh, began to grow and they got together, there's a passage, I think it's in Acts 4, where it says they sold everything they owned, land, homes, everything. And then they took the money and they put it at the apostles' feet and said, you guys just distribute that wherever it needs to go. And sometimes when we hear about discipleship, we can be kind of hammered that it's about how many possessions you have. It's about how much money you have. And there's, a, like the, like there's this level of materialism. I don't know at what point do you become materialistic and at what point are you not? Where's the marker? It's a hard one, isn't it? Because discipleship is not black and white. We wish it was. We wish it was black and white because then the work's all been done for us. We just know where the markers are. But at what point does a person become materialistic? I don't know. Is it when you have... I mean, if you have a Ford Falcon, you're obviously not materialistic. If you own a Ford, you're not, you can't be materialistic because Ford's a diamond. Say, anyone own a Ford here? Show, me, show of hands. Who's got a Ford? Holden. What about a Holden? Hands up if you've got a Holden or a Toyota. Ford, Holden, Toyota. Come on. You guys are not... You can't be materialistic if you own a Ford, a Holden or a, or a, or a Toyota, yeah? Will we agree on that? Anyone here own an Audi? What about a BMW? About a BMW motorbike. Anyone? <laughs> hey? Mercedes? Lexus? Either you're telling me lies or you're admitting you're materialistic. And you don't want to be seen for the materialistic man or woman you are. At what point do you become materialistic? I said this to them. I said, let's imagine that everybody in your gathering back at home, you go home, and everybody in that room runs out on Monday and sells everything they have, everything, their house, their business, their possessions, they sell everything and they run in the next Sunday and they give it to the pastor of your church. Then what? Then what? You can't afford a Ford, you just gave everything away. Then what? So we've got these ideas and mentalities about discipleship and it's very hard I find, anyway, it's hard to find a balanced perspective that's also a biblical perspective. So I want you to come on a bit of a journey with me over the next few weeks as we talk about discipleship. My commitment to you is this. I, I'm not going to give you a Christian beatdown. I'm actually giving everyone in this room the benefit of the doubt. I'm making some broad assumptions. Number one, everybody here loves Jesus. Amen? Hands up if you are grateful for the cross, grateful for what Jesus has done. I'm making an assumption that you all have good hearts and you want what God has for you. You want to be the people God wants you to be. And you want to do all the things God wants you to do. So I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. I'm assuming that. I'm also assuming that God loves you. So I don't want you to hear anything here that he doesn't to the contrary. In fact, I hope by the end of this, you realise even more and more how much he does love you because he has good things in store for us. So this is not to be a beat down, but I want your hearts to be open. And I want you to think about and meditate and listen to the Holy Spirit inside of you, because I'm not here to tell you this is what Keitha, this is what you look like as a disciple. I'm here just to say this is what Jesus taught about discipleship. And Holy Spirit, you speak to Kepha. And you speak to Daniel because you have different context and a different world in which you live and different issues to deal with on the journey to becoming that person. So this is not a one size fits all. But I'm also going to make this assumption that everyone in this room wants to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Hands up if that's true. 
Amen. Then it looks like we've got some good soil here that we can start planting a few seeds in. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, me and my wife went down to uh, the Gold Coast. We had our 25th, uh, 25th wedding anniversary. And yeah, we were excited too. Thank you so much. The Queen just walked in the building again. Oh, nice to see you, madam. I'm so glad you could be with us this morning. It's wonderful to have you. The Queen sounded Indian then, didn't she? Oh, very glad you could be here. Thank you very much. But... <laughs> But we had our 25th wedding anniversary, and here's what happened. We, we decided beforehand, here's we're going to do something kind of special. We're going to rewrite our vows to each other. And when we get to uh, the Gold Coast, and on that night, we're going to go out, which we did to a beautiful, beautiful place called DeVito's uh, on the river there at near, near South. It was an absolutely beautiful place, the Gold Coast. And we got there and the waiter comes out and he's singing in between. He's out there making hamburgers, oh, not hamburgers, uh, like Italian food and jazz. And then he just walks out with his gear on and starts singing these beautiful Italian songs to us. And he goes back for 20 minutes and cooks. If, if you get a chance to go, amazing atmosphere to go to DeVito's. And um, then at the end of the night when we'd finished, we walked outside. It's right on the water. We went to the edge of the water. And what we did is we reread these vows that we had written to each other. Yeah, I thought so too. And so Jackie read her vows to me, Alan, I could never have imagined such a great man. Um, I knew something was missing and then I met you and it's all been, you know, roses and, you know, you make me feel like, you know, the greatest thing in the world. You're, you're so handsome, good looking, strapping. Uh, where, where can I start? Where do I stop? Um, so anyway, so she reads her vows to me and I read my vows uh, to Jackie. But, but I learned something in the rewriting of those vows and here's what I learned. When we said I do, I didn't fully understand what it meant. How many of you married in this room? You said I do and then you woke up the next day and then you realised that I've said I do but I didn't really understand what it meant. Because now, see when, when we got married, I made a commitment to my wife. Now, in that commitment, I also made a commitment not just to be with her, but I made a commitment to become something different to her. I didn't marry her and just become another man in her life. I didn't commit myself to her and just go, well, let's get married, but at the end of the ceremony, I'm just going to be the, just another guy in your life, just another man. Now, I made a commitment to be a specific type of man, and the word for that man is a husband. When she committed herself to me, she didn't just commit to be another woman in my life, but she committed herself to me to be a type of woman. And that woman is described as a wife. And so we made a commitment to one another to not just be another person, but a type of person. And when you came to Jesus, you didn't just commit to be another person, another member of the multitude that are listening to what Jesus has to say. We were called to be something other than that, a particular type of person. And that particular type of person is called a disciple. Exactly. We weren't called. How many of you know Jesus didn't have a problem getting a multitude of people to listen to what he said? Jesus had no problem getting a multitude of people to listen to the words that came out of his mouth. A multitude were prepared to listen, but only a handful were prepared to follow. A multitude were prepared to listen, but only a handful were prepared to follow. And Jesus wants us to understand that when we connected ourselves to him, we made an agreement to become a particular type of person. And that type of person was not just someone who would listen to what he said, but someone who would follow. That particular type of person has a name, and that name is a disciple. Turn with me to Matthew 28 real quick. Get my glasses out. You all know this passage. Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. These are the believers. These are the ones that were still hanging around him after his resurrection. Not everybody that walked and listened to him was following him back at this point. This is the handful he's talking to. And he says this. He says, go therefore, and I want you to see the word, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe some of the things that I told you. 
Anyone catch the typo? All. That's a big call, isn't it? Teaching them to obey all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let me just give you some thoughts. Discipleship is not a topic to be covered. It's not a topic to be covered in a classroom. I told these students, they've just finished a six-month discipleship training school. But guess what? Discipleship is not a school. It's not six months. So they weren't finishing their discipleship training school. They were just moving on to another environment to continue their discipleship training. It's not a topic to be covered. Discipleship is not a box to be ticked. We've ticked our faith box with teaching. We've ticked our, our, our relationship box. We've, teach, we've ticked our discipleship box. We're not about ticking boxes here. It's not a box to be ticked. Discipleship is not a theology to be understood. We don't need to understand all the Greek and the Hebrew and the, and the context and all this stuff. It's great to know that, but that's not enough. It's not a, a topic or a theology that we need to understand. Discipleship is not a class to attend. Now, we can run classes and programs that help you grow in that journey, but discipleship itself is not a class. It never has been a class that you need to attend. Discipleship is a life that's lived 24-7 under the authority and guidance of Jesus. 24-7. The way I do my finances, the way I treat my children, the way I treat my wife, the way I communicate and treat my neighbours, the ethic I take to work, even when I've got a boss who might be like a sore thumb, the way I treat my employees, even when they're not perfect, the way I treat my teachers if I'm a student and I go to school, even the ones I don't like, the way I apply myself to my education and my learning, even if it doesn't stimulate me, make me feel it's not cool, it's not popular, it doesn't matter. It's about submitting and coming under the, 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 the guidance and the leading of the Holy Spirit in accordance with the words and teachings of Jesus. That's what discipleship is all about. Discipleship is not cool. It's kind of cool to follow Jesus. It's kind of cool to follow Jesus. It's okay to have a bit of a guru these days. It's okay to follow Jesus. But we're not called to follow. We're called to be disciples. Discipleship is the pinnacle of your potential. Think about that for a second. You were made, you were made to be a disciple of Jesus. Nothing else. You were created in the beginning to walk in relationship with God in every area of your life. You want to reach your fullest potential, then you need to understand discipleship is your maximum potential in life. It's that place where you are running at your best. It's the place where you're firing on all cylinders because that's the place you were created to live in. A goldfish is created to live in water. And if it's in that water, it thrives and it grows and it, it succeeds, it achieves. Take the goldfish out of water, it's over. Discipleship is your water. It's your oxygen. And your greatest potential is found in the depth and level of your discipleship. You were created to be a disciple. Therefore, discipleship is the pinnacle of your potential. But here's the thing. Christians are born. Jesus said, you must be born again. Christians are born, but disciples are made. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, enters your world, opens your eyes, and boof, brings spiritual life. So Christians are born by the Spirit, but disciples are made by other disciples. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying to these disciples, go into the world and make disciples, teaching them to do everything I've done. In other words, Jesus is saying, go, you're a disciple, go make a disciple who will go and make a disciple, who will go and make a disciple, who will go and make a disciple, who will go and make a disciple. Who will go and make a disciple. Disciples are made. Now, discipleship, as I said, it often comes across like a Christian beatdown. But if we understood what it actually was, it's nothing of the sort. I want you to turn to a tiny parable. I'll finish up. Matthew chapter 13. And this is what I want to leave you with today. Something I want you to chew on and think about for the rest of the week. Because this lays a foundation 
of understanding for everything else that we're going to talk about in the next few weeks. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 to 46. Two tiny little parables that Jesus tells, three verses with so much power in them. Jesus says this, again, the kingdom of heaven is like, let, let me just quickly tell you, by this stage of Jesus telling this parable, he had a multitude that were listening. But he's pulled away from the multitude and it says that he just gathered his disciples in a room. So he's speaking here to disciples. He's speaking here to disciples and look at what he says. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has. And he buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. The first tells of a man who just stumbles upon. He wasn't necessarily looking. He wasn't seeking anything in that field. He wasn't seeking treasure. He just stumbled across and he found it. But what's his response to the treasure? He goes, he sells everything that he has so that he can come back and buy the field where the treasure is. The second one is about a guy who's actually looking for valuable things. He's seeking, he's searching. And when he finds one of great price, what does he do? He does the same thing. He goes and sells everything and comes back and buys that thing. The first is, a, it's like a picture of a person who wasn't really looking for spiritual truth, wasn't really looking for Jesus, but stumbled across. Who was like that? I was like that. I wasn't one of these spiritual seekers as a kid. I wasn't looking for God. 19 years of age, I just kind of found God. I wasn't really, one, you know, some people, they're always looking into all the religions of the world and seeking. I just stumbled across. Anyone else in this room? Your journeys, you kind of stumbled across. It's not like it was the, the, the whole goal of your life was to find spiritual truth. I just stumbled across. The second one, the merchant, these merchants were intelligent men. <laughs> they were great businessmen. They were smart. And, and, and they would go looking for pearls and they would find pearls and they would study them and they would see the value in these pearls. This man found a pearl that had that much value that he sold everything else that he'd accumulated so he could have that one pearl. Gave up everything. Now here's what I want you to understand and think about with discipleship. Discipleship is about an exchange. It's an exchange of one thing for something of greater value. It's an exchange of something that it has value. This, this guy that stumbled across the pearl, the guy that stumbled across the treasure, he had things and plenty of them probably. They had a business, a house, maybe a car, he probably had other fields and, and, and so on. So he had stuff of value. But what he saw in the treasure, what he saw in the pearl was something of so much greater value that he was prepared to exchange what he had for something that was of greater value. He saw this thing as having greater value than the things that he already had. And discipleship, the life of discipleship is an exchanged life. It's an exchanging of something that, yeah, it might look very valuable, but it's an exchanging of something that you looked at and gone, that has way more value than this over here. When I was uh, a pastor in, 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 in another sort of church before here, um, uh, I, I had a little side gig, a little side job. And what I would do is I would buy and sell DVDs. Hands up if you know what a DVD is. It's like a cassette. It's like a CD with a picture on it. You've got to say that now because it's amazing. I go to the YWAM school and I start talking about a, a, a phone that you pick up and they're like, I have no idea. And I used to get up and, and I had to plug the cord in on the remote and they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I can sit in my lounge room and turn my air conditioner on in the, in the bedroom. I can be in my car downtown and I can change the settings on it. You know, this is the world we live in. But anyway, I digress. I used to buy DVDs. And what I would do is, there was a DVD called Beauty and the Beast. Who's ever seen that movie, Beauty and the Beast? Yeah? So here's what I used to do. I used to buy DVDs of Beauty and the Beast, the old Disney classic, the Disney film. And I would buy that DVD. And sometimes I'd walk into a shop and I would buy it for $50. I mean, that's the outrageous price for a DVD. That's expensive. Most movies these days are $20, whatever. About 50 bucks because they stopped making it. 
and they go in cycles. Disney go in cycles with their production and so on. So I used to go around. When I first started buying it, I found these DVDs for uh, $11. And I would buy them and I would sell them. And then it got to the point where I, they were all gone. And then the cheapest ones I could find were $50. But you know how much I'd sell them for? I would sell them for $180 each. So I would go there and I would pick up a DVD and I would think $50, that's outrageous. That is so expensive. That is going to cost me way too much. But I would exchange my $50 for that DVD. And then I'd take that DVD and that DVD in my hand would become $180. So I wasn't really losing anything. I was actually gaining something. It was an exchange that was actually in my benefit. Even though at the time it felt stupid and hard to part with $50, when you're parting with $50 and getting $180 back, who thinks that's a good exchange? That's a great exchange. This is what I used to do with DVDs. And I think that's a great picture of what discipleship is. It's an exchange of the current life that I have, the way I see things, my, my values. Here's the thing. We live in a culture, and it's not our fault. We've been brought up in a culture that tells us what success looks like. We've been brought up in a culture that tells us what will make you the most fulfilled. Let me give you an example, just, just an easy, tangible example. We've been told that if you have a lot of money and a lot of toys and a lot of financial security, you'll be blessed. That's what blessed looks like. You'll have peace, fulfillment, and so on. Let me tell you something. If the Holy Spirit taps you on the shoulder and says, sell everything, move to Brazil, and work amongst the favelas, the slum, the poor areas of Brazil, and serve the kids over there, you would get more fulfillment, you would feel more successful, and you would feel uh, more satisfied doing that than you would being here with the fastest car, biggest house, and so on. But see, we've been told culturally that that person, that if you ended up living in a slum, serving a bunch of poor kids with no home and no money, then, 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 then that's not successful. You wouldn't enjoy that. How do you know you wouldn't enjoy that? Let me tell you something. If God asked you to do it and you did it, you would enjoy that way more than you would enjoy being back here with all the toys. That's the reality. You would find more fulfillment there than you would back here with the popularity and the fame and everybody knows my name. You would find more satisfaction there. But we've been brought up with a cultural awareness of what gives us peace, what brings us joy, what brings us satisfaction, what success looks like, what, 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 all that stuff. We've got this picture. And here's the thing. Jesus is not trying to destroy our life. Discipleship is not about taking away from you. It's a divine exchange of something that, yes, it does have value. You look at the world and you look at what you got and your life and the direction and all that stuff. Yes, it could have great value for you. But Jesus is saying this, I'm not here to rip you off. I'm here to rip you up. I'm here to rip you up. It's a divine exchange. I don't want to take from you so that you don't have anything. Then what? He says, I want to exchange with you because you've got a life that you think is really, really great and power to you. But if you would follow me and listen to me, maybe I've got a life that looks different to that but gives you everything that you think you're going to get in that. But it's never enough. You keep seeking for more and seeking for more and seeking for more. And you can't find it. Because maybe, just maybe, the call to follow me, your discipleship journey is not about that. It's about this. These guys saw value in something. And they didn't give everything up to have nothing. Understand this. The merchant gave up everything to get something that was better. The man who found the field, he didn't just give everything up. Sometimes the salt with ship is preached like that. It's just about just give up everything and just give and just. It's, it's not, it's, we've got to change that mentality. No wonder people don't want to go hardcore for Jesus. No wonder people don't want to. Stand before the Lord and go, God, I'm serious. I'll give you everything. Because we've been told if you do that, he'll take everything away. I don't know whether he will, but what I know is this. He doesn't take anything away. He'll exchange it for something of greater value. Now, who doesn't want something 
of greater value than they've got. No matter how good you think it is right now, who doesn't want something of greater value, greater significance? Who doesn't want that? I want that. I, I, I love my life. But God, if there's a life out there that's greater, I want it. I want it. And I'm not going to get it by giving in to guilt or caving in to condemnation or comparing with others. I'm going to get it by walking with Jesus and listening to him and saying, Lord, I'm your disciple. I'm not a disciple of my culture. I'm not even a disciple of my denomination, my church or my pastor. I'm a disciple of Jesus. What does he have for us? The reality is this. That Jesus doesn't ask you to give up your life. He's asking you to take up your life. Discipleship is not about giving up your life. It's about taking up your life. Because he has a life that is so much more fulfilling, with so much more potential. The battle for us is this cultural view that we have that says this is what good life looks like. The battle for us is we think that if I surrender everything to Jesus, he'll actually take everything and I'll just be like a beggar in the street with nothing. Can, can you see what Jesus is saying here? The, the, the merchant sees something of such incredible value. The kingdom of God is like a treasure found in a field. That kingdom of God, it's a treasure in a field. And he looked at that treasure in the field and he said, you know what, I get it. I actually get it. That is worth way more than everything I've currently got. But I can't get that unless I actually do give this up. It's a divine exchange that takes place. That's what discipleship is all about. The reality is Jesus doesn't ask you to give up your life. He's asking you to take up your life the one you've always wanted, the one you were actually created to have, therefore the one that actually fits you personally best. Amen? You know, some years ago, I'll, I'll just get, Dan, you want to jump up? We're going to finish with a song. I've shared this story before, but I want to share it again. Some years back, I went and picked up my son, Caleb. He was at Richmond Christian College many years ago. And I picked him up because he... I had to go up to the Gold Coast and I was going to a football game, a rugby league game with the Bulldogs and I think it might have been the Cowboys were playing. And my son was a mad Bulldogs fan. Loved the Bulldogs. We've prayed for him. He's good now. Now he goes for the Titans. We shouldn't have prayed for him. <laughs> anyway, took him up there. But here's how I outplayed. He was so excited on Friday night to finish school and come home and watch it on TV. That was his dream. That was his goal. Get home and I'm going to watch it. We're going to sit down. We're going to watch the footy on telly. And I, I, me and Jackie got together and we conjured up this thing. Why don't we buy tickets? It's just up the road. And, and I'll, 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 I'll go up there and I'll take him to the game. He can sit in the stadium. He can actually experience it, not just watch it at a distance. And so I went to school and I picked him up. And, and I went in early and the, the teachers brought him out and because it was, we had to leave before school finished. Got in the car and he said, where are we going, Dad? I said, I've got to go up the Gold Coast because I've got a, a meeting up there and uh, mum, mum can't pick you up, so I had to pick you up. You're going to have to come with me. And I could tell he was like, okay, his brain's ticking over, but oh, I don't want to miss my game. We drove up in silence for a few minutes and he turns to me and goes, um, will we be home in time to watch the footy? And I said to him, look, I don't know. I don't, I, I, you probably won't get a chance to watch the game on TV tonight very strategic with my words wasn't a lie you probably won't be able to watch it on TV tonight but if we get back in time yeah but I said look I don't know and I could tell he was kind of disappointed about that understandable but being a good parent I played with his mind <laughs> we're driving up and we get through the border and we're down the Gold Coast and we're kind of driving and there's the lights of the stadium and I said to him oh see the, the stadium there, there the lights there that's where the game is tonight and he's like oh really I said, yeah. I said, look, we're a little bit early for <laughs> my meeting. We'll just go for a drive down and drive past the front. Do you want to see the stadium at least? He said, yeah, that'd be good. So we drove down and we went past the front of the stadium and he got to see the stadium. And there's a guy there who's directing traffic into the parking bay. 
And I said to him, oh, we'll just go into the parking bay and we'll just park the car there and, and, and have a look right up against the gate. So yeah, that'll be good. Penny still hasn't dropped for him. I'm, I'm, I'm showing a ticket, so the guy lets me in a parking gate. And he's still just not getting it. And I'm praying, Father, forgive me for what I've done. I don't know what I've done wrong here. But anyway, we're on a journey. So we drive on in and we get in, we park the car. I get out of the car, say, get out of the car, we'll go and have a walk around. He still doesn't get it. He still doesn't get it. And so we get out of the car and we're walking towards the gate. And I said to him, I'll go, but can you go back to the car? I left an envelope in the glove box. So he runs back to the car, opens up the glove box, gets the envelope out and walks along with the envelope. We're walking up to the gate and he still doesn't get it. I said, Caleb, have a look what's in the envelope. Opens it up. Here's these two tickets. It's got a big bulldog on one side and a big cowboy on the other. I mean, you can't miss it, but apparently you can. He's looking at it. He goes, oh, yeah, there, Dad. And I'm thinking he still doesn't get it. I said, Caleb, what? We're going to the game. <gasps> what? They're tickets, Caleb. They're tickets. We're going to the footy. And he was so excited. And we went in there, got right down on the fence. And he saw some of his you know, rugby league heroes and, 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 you know, calling out their names and so on. And we had a fantastic, fantastic night. But here's the thing. He thought he knew what was going to be the pinnacle. If I could just sit at home and watch the game on TV, that's the pinnacle. That's it. That's what I want to do. That's my fulfillment, my joy, my purpose. That's it. But his dad had other plans. But here's the thing. In order to have your father's plans, you've got to exchange what you thought was going to happen and come on the ride with me. And over the next few weeks, this is what my prayer is for us. Would we be prepared to go on a bit of a ride with Jesus? A bit of a ride with the Holy Spirit. I don't, I'm not going to tell you where it's going to land because I don't know. But are you prepared to go on a journey? All I know is this, that each of us think that sitting at home watching it on TV, we think that's the pinnacle, that's the best there's going to be. And we look forward to that and we plan our life around that. Maybe, maybe our Father has better plans, but we won't know unless we open our heart up to a divine exchange. Amen. See, God offers us unspeakable joy, but it might not come without tears. God offers us unfathomable prosperity, but it might not be in dollars. Unbelievable peace, but it might not come without conflict. Unmatched fulfillment, but it might not come without discomfort. And an unreal life, but it can't come without death. So, Father, I pray for each person here in this room right now. Lord, I pray, God, that each of us would listen to the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that we would open ourselves up to go on a journey with you, Lord. And, Father, we don't know where that journey ends. It, it probably ends with us leaving this shell and standing before you. But right now, God, we have plans and we have purposes. And God, maybe you'll say to us, you're spot on. You're spot on. Don't change a thing. You're doing great. Father, maybe you'll tweak a few things. God, maybe you'll turn us around and you'll send us in a completely different direction. God, the destination is yours. It's not ours. But Father, I pray for every person in this room that we would see in the life of discipleship, we would see the value of the kingdom and that we would at least be prepared for the next few weeks to lay down all those things that keep us fighting for what we have. That we would surrender and see the value in what you want to give to us, Lord. And God, it won't be easy, so I pray that, uh, Lord, your hand of love and grace would be upon us. Father, I pray that you would make sure that we're responding to the voice of the Spirit. Not guilt, not condemnation, but we're responding to the Holy Spirit. 
Because God, we want to be the people you want us to be and we want to do the things you want us to do. And Father, we want to have the things you want us to have for the glory of your name and for the building of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name. And this time, everybody said, that's good. I got more amens at the end there than we did at the start. Why don't we stand to our feet?